very much uh, after having uh, lunch with John talking about these issues, uh, decided this would be a, a useful uh, 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 program for the Tennessee World Affairs Council. And uh, I was really delighted that John was willing to do a presentation for the council on his work. So I'm gonna turn it over to John. Um, he has a PowerPoint presentation and he's going to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes about that. Then we'll have some questions. Uh, I've got some questions for him and then turn it uh, over to um, questions from the audience. John. Okay, well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. I wanna thank uh, uh, Professor Swartz and um, uh, Mr. Ryan and uh, the folks at the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Thank you very much. And just to sort of preface my conference, I have some slides about the geopolitics of Central Asia, which I hope will provoke some questions, but I've been getting more and more interested in Central Asia over the years. My field is, was actually Middle East studies, but I've been sort of migrating further east uh, as I go along. And I was fortunate, I was able to apply and receive the Fulbright to Tajikistan. And part of the reason I chose to go to Tajikistan was because it was the only one of the Central Asian countries where Persian is widely spoken. And I had taken some Persian in graduate school. So it was a really an eye-opening experience and I, I really treasure my time there. And I hope uh, I can return, uh, go back again in the very, very near future. But on to my presentation, which is the geopolitics of Central Asia. I hope you can all see my screen. Um, Basically, uh, Central Asia, well, there we go. Uh, Central Asia was sort of known to many historians as the site of the great game of the 19th century. This was a competition between the Russian Empire and the British Empire uh, for control in that part of the world, world. The Russians were expanding southward and putting pressure on British India. And again, you have to remember at this time, British India also included Pakistan as well. Um, and sort of, they agreed that Afghanistan would be kind of a buffer state and essentially pretty much set the boundary lines um, in the late 19th century, demarcating sort of the Southern portion of the Russian empire and independent Afg Afghanistan, which is now pretty much the, um, the borders that you see today, uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan border on Afghanistan. It was uh, when I was in the country of Tajikistan, I taught, um, I taught at the University of Central Asia in Khwarag, which is right on the border uh, with Afghanistan. But Central Asia was also becoming significant in, in sort of academic circles in the late 19th, early 20th century, because it's at this point that the you started to develop the idea of geopolitics came into vogue. And this is largely with the work of the British geographer, J. Halford Mackinder, who wrote a very influential paper in 1904 for the Royal Geographic Society called The Geographical Pivot of History. And he argued that you're know, looking at the world geographically that basically whoever controlled Eastern Europe commanded the heartland, which he defined, as you can see from this map, as sort of a large part of the Eurasian landmass encompassing Central Asia. So who rules Eastern Europe commands the heartland, who rules the heartland commands the world island, and who rules the world island commands the world. So again, a lot, and he influenced a lot of other uh, geographers and political leaders at the time who kind of came to view Eurasia, particularly Central Asia, as being really, really important uh, geostrategically. Uh, looking today at the geography of Central Asia, you have here, and we define Central Asia as the stand countries of formerly part of the, that were formerly part of the Soviet Union. So Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, but also Afghanistan obviously plays a strong role in Central Asia as well as Pakistan as well. And again, if you look at the countries of Central Asia, by far Kazakhstan is the largest country. It's the ninth largest country in the world. Um, it's rich in oil and national gas. And it's through Kazakhstan that Chinese goods flow to Russia and eventually to Western Europe. 
Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about the Belt, China's Belt and Road Initiative, because Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan is central in that. Kyrgyzstan is probably, I put here the most democratic, I guess you could probably say it's the least authoritarian of the Central Asian states. Um, it has had a number of changes of government since the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, Tajikistan is the smallest and poorest of the Central Asian countries. Uh, the language is Indo-European and Tajik is, um, uh, the Tajik language is essentially Persian while the other countries have Turkic uh, based languages. Turkmenistan is the most closed of the Central Asian republics. It is rich in natural gas, although it's starting to open up a little bit more to the West, a little bit more to Europe. Um, Uzbekistan is the largest country in terms of population uh, in, in, that region, uh, in that region. So again, you have a number of countries, they have a lot in common. They're all, um, with the exception of Turkmenistan, they are all members of the Commonwealth of Independent States which is an org organization of essentially former areas that used to be part of the Soviet Union. And it's really um, a vehicle by which Russia exerts a certain degree of control. I should mention that all of these countries, Russian is still widely spoken. Um, and in fact, in some ways, when I was in, living in Dushanbe for part of my time in Tajikistan, Russian seemed to be the preferred language of many people in uh, in Dushanbe. Um, Central Asia during the Soviet period, after the Russian Civil War, the area was kind of reabsorbed as part of the now Soviet Union, and they reasserted control largely through Union republics and various autonomous regions. And the lines were drawn to suit political interests. And as a result, ethnic groups were usually not kept together. And actually, this was done really by design so as to not have all of one ethnic group kind of concentrated in one area. And this has had major implications for when there is no Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union broke up, because now you have all of these independent states and many of them have territorial issues with each other. You may have followed the news recently, there's been flare ups on the Tajik Kyrgyz border because you have enclaves of Tajikistan that are completely within uh, Kyrgyzstan and access to these have been difficult and there have been border clashes and, and relations with, between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan are not very good at this point. In Eastern Tajikistan, you have a, a fairly decent sized Kyrgyz population uh, near Morgab and the, those areas out to the east towards China. Uh, primarily, you have a Kyrgyz population, Sunni Muslims, as opposed to uh, Ismailis, which you find in uh, prevalent in other parts of eastern uh, Tajikistan. Uzbekistan has a large Tajik population. The cities of Bukhara and Samarkand are in many ways Tajik cities, but they were left in Uzbekistan. Tajikistan used to be part of Uzbekistan. Uh, it was sort of an autonomous region within Uzbekistan. Then in 1929, it became its own Soviet Socialist Republic. But those cities were left, those areas were left off and left uh, still as part of Uzbekistan. Um, Soviet rule in Central Asia, again, they attempted to develop the region, um, developing industry and agriculture with sometimes rather tragic consequences. A major emphasis was on cotton cultivation, which is still prevalent in many parts of Central Asia, but this had rather dramatic environmental effects as the irrigation for these cotton fields led to the Aral Sea. I, I'm sorry, I misprinted there, it should be drying up, not tying up, sorry about that. Uh, but you can see parts of what would have been the Aral Sea are now desert. The Aral Sea still exists, but it's only a fraction of its former size. Uh, you can really go on the internet and look at maps, the Aral Sea at this particular date and time versus the Aral Sea now, and you see a very, very big uh, contrast. The end of the Soviet Union, it was really interesting. I'd become interested in Central Asia when I was in grad school, and I, a lot of the scholarship was, yeah, the Iranian Revolution had just happened, 
the Soviet Union eventually might fall down because of Islamic revolution in Asia, uh, in Central Asia. But that didn't happen. In fact, if anything, when the Soviet Union was breaking up, it was the Central Asian elites that were trying to hold it together um, and, and didn't necessarily want the Soviet Union to go away because they were dependent on you know, huge subsidies coming from Moscow. Plus the leadership were all you know, Communist Party apparatchiks from, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and they didn't know what to do essentially. Now, most of them sort of reinvented themselves as nationalists um, after the breakup and some of them lived, you know, and some of them ruled for quite a long time. This is a photo of Nazarbayev who was the longtime president of Kazakhstan. He just stepped down a few years ago. Um, but he was instrumental in creating the Commonwealth of Independent States as to sort of have some kind of a vehicle where you could have some coordination among the now former Soviet states. And, and Russia really has used that to promote its interests. And also Russia, in addition to strategic and economic interest and cultural interest, they also view themselves as protecting the Russian populations that still remain in these, um, in these countries. And especially in Kazakhstan, there's still a fairly significant Russian population. Some of the other countries, maybe not as much, but, uh, but, it's, still, but it's still there. Uh, again, I've already mentioned about the Commonwealth of Independent States. Um, not every former Soviet country is a member of that, but most of the Central Asian countries are with the exception of uh, Turkmenistan. China is also becoming very, very important in the region. The region is central for China's belt and road strategy um, of getting goods out of China to Western markets, to global markets, and also uh, as a market in and of itself for Chinese goods and also access to uh, raw materials, uh, oil and gas from Kazakhstan, gas from Turkmenistan, rare earth metals from Tajikistan. All of this is seen as very, very important for the Chinese economy. They are also very concerned about the security of Western uh, China, the Xinjiang region, which is this very vast autonomous region of Western China, where the Uyghurs live, who are um, Chinese citizens, but they are uh, Muslim in, in religion. Uh, and there have been calls for independence and greater autonomy in uh, Xinjiang. And the Chinese are very, very concerned about that and very, very concerned about Islamic appeals uh, to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And China uses the SCO at much like Russia uses the CIS to try to promote its influence in, uh, the, in Central Asia. And here you have sort of a representation of the Belt and Road Initiative, how extensive that is, not only going through Central Asia, but going through other parts um, of Asia as well, and all the different corridors that China is developing. Obviously, you know, a China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, a Eurasian land bridge, which would impact the Central Asian countries specifically, but also other areas as well, going through Southeast Asia, especially. So what is the US region? What is the US relationship in the region? Well, part of what was defining the US in the region was its close proximity to Afghanistan. As I mentioned, three of the Central Asian countries have direct borders with Afghanistan, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan have rather extensive borders. And these were seen as critical as supporting the American military effort or the NATO military effort uh, in Afghanistan. The US has organized the C5 plus one group, all the Central Asian countries plus the United States to coordinate uh, policies. The US is very much involved in border security. Uh, all of the Central Asian republics are part of NATO's Euro-Atlantic Partnership Council. So they have interactions with NATO and NATO countries. Um, the US has spent a great deal on border security and conducting border training, uh, has trained over 2,600 border guards in the various countries. And the US also exercises a great deal of soft power, funding more than 70 pro projects in the region to promote cultural antiquity, anti antiquities and historical sites. And I was, I was very pleasantly surprised when I was in Tajikistan and saw that a lot of 
the cultural areas in, in Tajikistan had been refurbished and upgraded largely with American uh, assistance and support. This included mosques and other historical sites. I was very pleasantly surprised uh, at that, and, and I thought that was a very good thing. The US also funds a number, numerous educational opportunities for citizens of the Central Asian Republics to engage in professional development, to learn English. The American spaces, which are sort of scattered across the region are supported by the US embassy. And they're sort of gathering places, especially for young people to learn English, gain computer skills, take classes. Uh, I myself, when I was living in Dushanbe, Ahorag, I, um, I volunteered in American spaces and did a number of classes and they were just so happy to meet people who were sort of native speakers of English and talk about the United States and talk about uh, different kinds of things. So um, so I had a little bit of firsthand experience of that with American soft power. But that's that's the gist of my presentation. I know I covered a lot in a fairly you know quick period of time, but I think, uh, Tom, do you have anything you want me to elaborate on further? No, I think we can move into sort of just questions right now and okay. some of the questions that I've already I'd like to pose to you. Um, okay. So um, I was, yeah, let, let me start off by simply saying, of course, that this is a very remote region to most Americans. This is not a, uh, and especially now that Afghanistan is no longer uh, a American area uh, for regrettably or, or whatever, um, this is a part of the world that seems very distant. And I wanted to ask you um, a question that I've, I've, I've uh, allowed you to give you some time to think about, but what are the American national interests here? What, do, what does it really matter that the United States is involved? And, and um, from your own experience there, which clearly had a, a powerful impact on you, um, uh, what did you come away with in terms of thinking about the national interest of the United States in uh, Central Asia. Well, again, unlike say Russia and China, which are sort of in the neighborhood, and maybe you could, and Russia obviously has long time interests and cultural interests and uh, and whatnot. And China, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative is kind of the centerpiece of Chinese development. U.S. interests are not as clear, and I think a lot of it was being driven sort of by Afghanistan, which is not really on the table anymore. But I think American interest still is in promoting um, sort of good government and promoting also, you know, an understanding of the United States and also to some extent, American economic interests as well. I mean, US imports to Tajikistan have increased by quite a lot the last several years. And I think, you know, that's, again, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge amount, but it's something and it's there. And I think, you know, the U.S. wants to promote itself as kind of a counterweight to Russia and China. And maybe some people in the region do kind of see the U.S. as kind of a counterweight, uh, maybe because it is sort of a bit more removed uh, than, say, Russia or China. I know, you know, a lot of people while they may maybe appreciate some of the opportunities, economic opportunities for the country of the China's Belt and Road Initiative, they're a little wary that China may be exerting a little bit of too much influence. You know, China controls a lot of the public debt of uh, Kyrgyzstan, of Tajikistan. Most of the new construction I saw walking around Dushanbe was clearly being financed by China. So there was a little bit of concern, maybe there needs to be a little bit more balance, at least from you know, average people you know, on the street, so to speak. And maybe this is why they look to the United States. I think they just appreciate the idea of being able to learn English because English is becoming the lingua franca of the world, essentially, uh, sort of displaced French as the sort of the, the language that people would like to speak after their own. And there's more economic opportunities, study opportunities abroad um, if they know English. So this is why the American spaces are extremely popular with, with really all people, particularly young people, but, but all people as well. And so I think there are a lot of opportunities there for the US to exert influence and influence in a good way, um, get people to think about you know, things like 
democracy and ideals and limited government and, and, and help spread those ideas to a certain degree, but also uh, their knowledge of English and the opportunities they may have uh, with that knowledge. Let me let me um, ask you. Uh, uh, Pat sent a note, maybe to, to turn off the screen sharing, or the if you oh, could, John. Sorry, um, yeah, yeah. Just to allow that. Um, but okay, let me um, let me ask you. Um, let me ask you, as you alluded to the idea uh, of American um, uh, ideals, particularly democracy, um, limited government, uh, economic freedom, these sorts of things. Did you find in your own experience that um, uh, there was uh, an interest or a belief that uh, the country uh, should try to become more democratic, or do you, and and here I'm um, also taking into account the Biden administration's emphasis on this notion that there's a a, a sort of a, a competition between autocracy and democracy. Um, is Central Asia an area that could be an area of competition between political systems? Or in effect, are we really dealing with a part of the world that is likely to be pretty autocratic for a long period of time? I think in the near future, I'm not, I'm not, you're probably not gonna see a whole lot of political change. As I mentioned in my introductory comments, probably Kyrgyzstan is, I wouldn't even say it's the most democratic, it's probably the least authoritarian of all those countries. I mean, they are characterized, I mean, they are, out of the Soviet system, the people who run those countries um, until relatively recently, and in some cases still are a product of the Soviet system. Uh, so I don't think they're gonna change anytime soon. Their politics is very much at the center. And this is a problem sometimes with minorities within the country, whether they're an ethnic minority or a religious uh, minority, that can be problematic. I mean, development varies widely from one part, I mean, you know, you go, uh, you know, the capital cities are beautiful, well laid out, you know, and whatnot, they look attractive, but then, you know, you go into rural villages and, you know, there's still issues, you know, major basic infrastructure uh, issues. Um, you know, corruption is a problem really endemic throughout the region, uh, which is another thing maybe, you know, holding back development in some ways. So. I don't see any massive political changes coming in the very near future. But again, if more people can kind of get these ideas and think about it and get exposed to other parts of the world, I mean, the US Embassy has a number of different, um, you know, State Department has a number of different programs, you know, bringing students to the United States for maybe even just short periods of time, uh, a semester or a year or even less. Uh, sometimes with summer programs. I mean, that'll help in the long in the long run. I think you know help to really instill these ideas. I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow, but you know maybe down the road um, it'll it'll sort of terminate. Well, one of the one of the interesting uh, offshoots, of course, of the Russian campaign in Ukraine, and particularly in recent weeks, as as Russia has been uh, suffering setbacks is the sense that uh, this weakens the degree to which Russia is a dominant power in this region. And you alluded to, of course, the, the clashes that are taking place between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, particularly. Um, do you foresee uh, a more violent and chaotic region if Russia's power declines? That's an interesting question. Um, I think Russia is still the, though, does hold a lot of cards in the region when it comes to military, like they have their Russian border. Russian, the Russian military has never really left Tajikistan. They were there during the independence period. They were there during the civil war. They are very strong supporters of the current government of Tajikistan. There are Russian border guards along the Afghan border. So I don't think they're going to not be a player anytime soon. I mean, they're sort of reverses in Ukraine, notwithstanding, but because a lot of the country, not just Tajikistan, but many of the other countries do kind of look to Russia um, and are still somewhat dependent on Russia to varying degrees. Tajikistan is really dependent on Russia because so many Tajiks work in Russia and it is a, the 
country that is really run on a remittance economy. So they're extremely dependent on what goes on in Russia. Maybe Kazakhstan a little bit less so and the other countries to, 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 to varying degrees. But I don't think Russia is gonna lose its influence anytime soon. Um, there's actually been reports lately that a large number of Russian young men particularly went into Central Asia to avoid oh, the yeah. draft. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah, curious what type of, do you, do, you, do you think the, that type of, um, of migration will have any type of influence? Um, it might, it depends how long those folks stay for. If they stay for, you know, my guess is it's for, they're intending to stay for a short period of time mm -hmm. until the conflict subsides, but you never know, you know, when the conflict is going to subside. Um, there has been a history of Russian migration into Central Asia. I mean, part of this was during consolidating control and encouraging Russian and Ukrainian peasants into, uh, Central Asia, and then of course Stalin sort of used Central Asia as like a dumping ground for ethnicities that he felt were somehow politically suspect, both before and during and after World War II. So you do have a certain amount of immigration into uh, the sort of a history of immigration into Central Asia. So it could have a, an effect if these folks end up staying for a longer time and intermarrying and and, and whatnot. Has the um... Uh, the, the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban had an impact at all on these uh, states in terms of either refugees or uh, fears of Taliban extremism uh, migrating into Central Asia? Well, that was certainly a concern. And um, Tajikistan had a fair number of uh, immigrants from Afghanistan. I had the pleasure of, of working at the American Space space extension in Verdat, which is near Dushanbe, was primarily served, I mean, it wasn't exclusively for Afghans, but primarily served uh, the Afghan population. And uh, part of it was also because part of the ethnic dynamic of Afghanistan are Tajik, so they speak the same language and, and, and similar customs and whatnot. So so Tajikistan was sort of a, a natural uh, place of immigration for them. Um, you, I didn't see a huge exodus while I was there because I think most of the exodus had already happened. The border borders were closed, but um, I know for a, at least initially, Tajikistan was the only one of the Central Asian countries that still was not was not accepting the Taliban, like a lot of the other Central Asian countries started to negotiate with the Taliban, but Tajikistan was somewhat resistant. I think they've softened that a little bit because there was that fear perhaps of, um, of uh, this massive migration and uh, whatnot into Tajikistan. But there's also fears of also, you have organizations like the, um, the Islamic State of Khorasan province, which is, which is geared towards Central Asians. And they've claimed that they're doing a lot of, um, of uh, sort of recruitment or attempting to recruit people from Central Asia, particularly from Tajikistan and, and other places. So that is, that is kind of in the minds of the leadership of these countries. It's also in the minds of Russia, China as well, because there are links between those groups and maybe Uyghur um, Islamic groups as well, and also to some degree, the United States as well. I should as, mention um, there's also some Chinese troops in Tajikistan as well. So Tajikistan oh. is kind of unique. <laughs> has Al-Qaeda has Al Qaeda or other sort of more radical terrorist groups had any, developed any presence in the Central Asian um, countries? You know, it's, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are people mostly in exile who were from Central Asia, who were fighting with the Islamic State or fighting with Al Qaeda. Um, Tajikistan is really kind of interesting because they were the only, um, it's a tragic actually, because they were the only one of the Central Asian countries that experienced a civil war uh, in the aftermath of the Soviet Union. There was a conflict and the, it basically saw the traditional sort of communist leadership that was now sort of reinventing themselves as nationalists versus sort of a collection of sort of people who believed in democracy, 
and some ethnic groups and also um, an Islamic group as well. Uh, they were collectively called like the United Tajik Opposition and they fought a civil war and then finally uh, a peace deal was agreed to in 1997 brokered in part by Russia, the United States and the UN in which there was supposed to be power sharing and a certain amount of some of the, these militia militaries were supposed to be absorbed in the Tajik military and uh, there's supposed to be positions in government. But over the years, the central government has kind of squeezed them out and exerted a great deal of control. So there, there may be some appeals to people who may feel they may not necessarily be strong Islamists, but they may feel, well, there's no other alternative but to support these people because they have, you know, the resources to help us. So that, you know, in, in some respects, the policies of some of these governments may be pushing people to go that route, even though they might not have normally gone that route, but because they feel they may have no other alternative. Well, yes, I mean, the authoritarianism of, of these states and their, their strict uh, control undoubtedly uh, uh, has an impact on um, uh, political uh, political behavior there. I am curious, um, there was a recent report that Kyrgyzstan actually canceled some military maneuvers from the uh, CSTO that were going to take place. Yeah. And there was this sort of notion that perhaps Russian influence was being weakened. There was also the UN vote the other day on secession, on the uh, um, condemning the Russian annexation of provinces in which a number of the Central Asian countries voted along uh, yeah, against yeah. Russia. I mean, the, there are some Central Asian countries that are trying not to be because they're trying to maintain a relationship with China. They're trying to maintain a relationship with the United States. Um, they're, so they may be kind of backing off from, you know, support of total support from Russia. But there's a few there's a few that are still very supportive of Russia as well. Um, so again, the opinion is kind of mixed depending on what Central Asian country you're you're looking at. If you were in the, uh, if you were able to give advice to the president or to the secretary of state on priorities for the United States in Central Asia, what would you think, what, what where would you prioritize uh, American involvement there? What would you, what would you think would be the most uh, cost-effective things the United States could do in Central Asia? I think probably the most cost effective things would be focusing more on soft power issues. I think you'll get a, a good reception from the population, um, helping the agriculture, helping certain sectors like agriculture is really, really important because a lot of the, a lot of the countries, you know, agriculture is still a big thing and that's really helpful, uh, especially a country like Tajikistan, which is 93% mountains. So um, they have to really maximize what arable land, you know, they have. That, that is important and that'll probably pay a lot more dividends than just focusing on like security issues. I mean, security is an issue. I mean, these countries have long borders and yeah, that's part of it. And the US has been very active in terms of border security, but that certainly shouldn't be the whole thing. And uh, getting them to try to work together through the C5, I think would also be good, especially Hopefully that'll build some bridges between countries like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan that have kind of been at odds with each other. And mm -hmm. it's not really gonna serve any purpose if they if they get into a more protracted uh, conflict. It's just gonna sort of impact negatively the people who live in those regions. So I think, I, I think focusing more on the soft power would probably be the, the way to go for the United States. And also it wouldn't necessarily panic Russia or China to think that the US was trying to, you know, circumvent their positions. Let me let me ask you as a final question here before we open it up to the uh, questions in the uh, Q&A. Um, what was your sense of the impact of American popular culture in this region of the world? Did you oh, find that... yourself having to explain aspects of America that people had learned or absorbed through uh, popular culture outlets? Not as much as I would have thought. Like, for example, when I was in Dushanbe, I was there in February, and there was a real interest in doing programming on Black History Month, for example. Um, there was a lot of uh, interest in that, looking at 
the contributions of African Americans to politics, to music, to sort of American culture in general. So there was a real sort of curiosity about, about the United States. Um, and uh, I didn't encounter any like anti-Americanism at all. In fact, people were more than happy to talk to me when they found I was from the United States. I mean, again, if they spoke English, they maybe wanted to practice their English or just curious or because, you know, there weren't, I mean, Central Asia for most Americans is kind of off the beaten track. I mean, it's not like there were no Americans there, but most Americans I came into contact with were people who either worked for the embassy or for work for various programs like education programs and things like that. I didn't see too many American business people or anything like that. I came across a group of hunters <laughs> at one point. That was about it. I think they were hunting um, and you have to get special permission to like hunt the Marco Polo sheep or something. Uh, and they they were in Horog actually. They weren't in Dushanbe, which was really interesting because Horog is like 12 hours from Dushanbe by road. So it's like, that's like maybe not quite the most remote part of the country, but almost, um, you know, so that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, you don't see, it's not like, you know, American tourists or anything like that. Although supposedly they were doing a, um, I'm not sure if this came off, they do a music festival in Horog and they at least were talking about having someone from Nashville come and perform. I don't, wow. I don't know if that came off or not. Uh, oh, that's fascinating. Gone by the time I was there, but yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Pat, uh, could you see if there's some, some questions we can uh, go to? Sure. Now? Thanks. First, let me thank you guys again. Um, We've been talking with uh, Professor uh, John Miglietta uh, from Tennessee State University, who was a Fulbright in Tajikistan, and Professor Tom Schwartz, distinguished historian at Vanderbilt. It makes me want to run out and sign up for classes at Vanderbilt and, and TSU to, to sit and listen to you guys uh, more. This is a fascinating conversation. Uh, John, you touched on the uh, impact of American soft power in the region, and we have a question from Hayden Duke. Uh, you, you answered it in, in some respects about uh, not really riling Russia or China for America uh, to get involved in that way. And, and uh, Hayden asked about uh, whether further aid would increase uh, pressure or violence uh, even from the other two great powers. And let me combine that with a, a question that we have from Karen uh, St. John, who uh, asked about tensions between Russia and China. Uh, you know, uh, these countries are, uh, for the most part, in the uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, uh, the successor to the Soviet Union. Uh, and China has the Belt and Road going through all of them, except for uh, Kyrgyzstan, is, is that right, or Uzbekistan? Uh, uh, in any case, it goes through Uzbekistan too. Yeah, I think it okay. pretty much touches all the Central Asian countries. So, so China has uh, economic interests in the region uh, in a significant way, and Russia has political and security interests. Uh, so uh, talk a little bit of, uh, more about uh, the concern for American influence in the region, which I suspect is waning after the Afghanistan uh, withdrawal. But, uh, you know, we, we saw Putin and Xi uh, back in February um, declaring this uh, relationship without bounds. But uh, is, is there a potential for tension over Central Asia? Well, I mean, in a way, as China develops further contacts with Central Asia, as I, as I mentioned, they hold a good bit of the public debt of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, especially. Um, they're doing a lot of investment in infrastructure, um, which again, some parts of the region really need quite badly because you have remote parts of the region where, I mean, you, know, you literally have one road and it gets blocked or whatever. So. So you need a lot of infrastructure development. So um, that's obviously gonna help China. And I guess Russia could see it as possibly a threat down the road. On the other hand, if it supports countries that are friendly to Russia, then that can be mutually um, beneficial. Most of these countries are together in the um, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, both Russia and China are members as well as all the Central Asian countries, again, I think, except for Turkmenistan, I think they're observers. Turkmenistan doesn't join a lot of organizations that China does. They're probably the most closed of um, 
of the Central Asian uh, republics. Um, so again, there's a potential for cooperation there and joint diplomacy, joint negotiation there. So, I mean, yeah, there could be conflicts down the road. I think right now they're both pretty content to leave things probably as they are. I mean, Russia has its hands full in Ukraine and China is sort of distancing itself from Russia in terms of Ukraine, but they're not really trying to upset Russia too much because they're trying to to pursue the Belt and Road Initiative, which is really geared to sending goods into Russia and eventually to the other parts of the world. What it does suggest though, John, doesn't it, is, is that China may eventually through economic means somewhat uh, surpass Russia as an influence in this region. Yes, China's perhaps, economy yeah. may dictate that. Yeah. yeah. Right now though, so many people in the region, particularly in Tajikistan, maybe to a lesser extent in Kyrgyzstan, work in Russia. So they are very dependent on uh, those remittances coming back from Russia. This is why when the sanctions started, in the aftermath of Russia's invasion in Ukraine, you saw a jump in prices in Tajikistan uh, quite quite dramatically uh, for many people. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Russian ruble took a beating and that meant, you know, people's money was worth less in terms of when they were doing the, the remittances. And so many people had the experience of working in Russia, even though they may not work in Russia now, they had worked in Russia in the, the recent past or new people or had friends and family working in Russia. That, but this, well, this we, suggests, John, this suggests that there might be a, the impact of the sanctions, the Western sanctions on Russia may have a, an impact in the sense of oh, reducing Russia's economic clout in Central Asia. Yeah, uh, ultimately, yeah that could uh, happen. But, yeah. but I, think, I think right now, most of those countries are still mm -hmm. pretty dependent on Russia. So I don't see any change anytime soon. But maybe long term, you're right. Maybe China might end up displacing Russia, although people are concerned about China, too. I mean, they're not it's like, well, you know, it's a difficult proposition. And that's why for many people, the United States looks very appealing. You know. uh, that, that was a point I was going to make, uh, Tom, that, that uh, Russia, some people are, see that as increasingly a vassal of China. So it would be difficult, I think, for Russia to push back on any Chinese uh, encroachment, um, although there, there could be uh, some resentment. Uh, let me ask you, uh, John, about the vote uh, in the United Nations General Assembly to uh, label Russia's annexation of the provinces uh, in eastern Ukraine as illegal. Um, Russia had the support of, I think, North Korea, Belarus, Syria, Nicaragua, uh, and that was about it. The Central Asian states all abstained. What, what's the yeah. signal there? Well, I think the signal is they didn't vote against it, but they didn't, uh, you know, again, I, I think it was showing, yeah, we don't, we don't like, they're not that enthralled with what Russia did, but, and maybe they don't want it to get repeated in certain areas, like, you know, Northern Kazakhstan has a large Russian population, so I can understand the Kazakhs being very, and they border Russia directly. So right. I could see them being very skittish about that. But I think it's also, uh, you know, they didn't want to get condemned by the rest of the world. And, you know, they wanted to sort of keep their, their, their lines of communication open with China and the United States. So I think, you know, again, it was showing, I guess, some modicum of displeasure with Russia, but not a total break with Russia. Sure. Talking about uh, Kazakhstan, Karen St. John asks about Russian-Kazakh relations. And we know we had the, the bloody crackdown in January in Kazakhstan and, and the introduction of Russian troops to mm -hmm. help support the government in, in what was a, a very uh, strong response to demonstrations. I think it was over fuel prices or some fuel commodity. Prices, uh, among other things, yeah. Yeah. So uh, where, where, does, uh, where does the relationship between Moscow and, and uh, the Kazakh stand? Well, I think it's much like most of the other Central Asian countries. I mean, they're formerly part of the Soviet Union. You, in, in Kazakhstan, you actually have a large Russian population. It's I think the Kazakhs are only a little bit more than 50% of Kazakhstan, and especially like Northern Kazakhstan is still very Russian. 
So I think, you know, the relationship is still going to be there for the foreseeable future. Um, and again, a lot of the political leadership in Kazakhstan probably still came out of the Soviet system. They were probably somewhat young at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union, but they're still sort of products of that system. So I, I think I, I don't I don't I don't see it changing dramatically in the near future unless you know you have major major earthquakes taking place in Kazakh politics. But I and as you see, they were they, you know they sent troops in and they've done this in other countries as well. Uh, use use their use their military to come in. In some cases, as I mentioned in Tajikistan, the Russian military never really left. I mean, they've always kind of been there, even at independence through civil war and uh, and whatnot. So I still think they're not going to be shy about using their military to help like potential allies in the region. We have a question from Orbit and Colton. Uh, the population there, Sunni Muslim? Um, most of the region are Sunni Muslim. Um, where I, Actually, where I was in Tajikistan, uh, they were uh, the dominant religion was Ismaili Muslim. So in that eastern part of Tajikistan called the GBAO, the borno Barakstan mm -hmm. Autonomous uh, Region, Autonomous Oblast, um, the bulk of the population are Ismaili um, Shiites who kind of view the, who view the Aga Khan as their spiritual leader. And the Aga Khan development network has been very big in the region, in the entire region of Central Asia in supporting local populations and things like um, um, businesses and power plants. And um, the university I was at, the University of Central Asia, um, is uh, supported by the Aga Khan development network. They have uh, a branch campus in Kyrgyzstan, in Tajikistan, and there's one being developed in uh, Kazakhstan. And again, their mission was to support sort of the mountainous uh, regions of, the, of, 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 of Central Asia. So for the most part, Sunni Muslim, um, again, it varies. Uh, most of the governments do not let play up Islam. Uh, as uh, part of the identity, I mean, people are Muslims. They 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 um they go to um they go to mosque. I mean, when I I happened to be in um, Dushanbe during Ramadan, and there was a lot of people going to mosque, particularly on Fridays. A lot of people keeping the fast. Um, in uh, you know the, the sun up to sundown, not eating or drinking, which is I don't I don't think I could do that. Let's put it that. Uh, but uh, but uh, you know I, I was I was really impressed by that that uh, that even though the government was not sort of focusing a lot on religion that a lot of people in their own private life was still was still you know. Can I uh, interject here and just ask yeah. John, did you see much in the way of Turkish influence in Central Asia? A lot of products from Turkey, a lot from Turkey, and uh, often people. Of uh, uh, in the region, most of these countries are Turkic-speaking countries: uh, Kazakh, Uzbek, uh, Kyrgyz, Turkmen. They're all like a, a variations of, of part of a Turkic family of languages. Um, not Tajikistan; they're Persian-speaking, uh, but yet you saw a lot of Turkish influence in the marketplaces. A lot of goods were from Turkey. I bought some things myself, though. With them. Uh, that was sort of the, the largest economy where they were getting like clothing, especially. John, we're uh, we're getting down to the end here. I, I want to get some more questions in, so if we could uh, keep the uh, answers short. Uh, Andrew Patrick uh, tells us uh, when he was in Abu Dhabi, he saw a lot of Kazakh engineers working there uh, after the Arab Spring. Uh, the UAE was less interested in Arab engineers. Uh, he he asks about the uh, the state of higher education in the region. And uh, is is it uh, is there a surplus of engineers and professionals that they could export them? Well, uh, again, uh, uh, again, it's part of the old Soviet system. I mean, they have a lot of universities. The universities tend to be centered more or less in the major cities, not as much 
on the outlying areas. That's, I mean, I, where I was in Harag was somewhat unique because we actually had two universities. There was a state university that had been around for a while. And then there was the University of Central Asia, which was relatively new, which was a private um, university. But that's kind of an exception. Uh, in most rural areas, uh, the, 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 the educational opportunities were limited. You really had to be in like a major urban area to attend universities. And of course, in Dushanbe, there were several universities. There's a, a business and international affairs university. There's a there's a medical university, there's you know very engineering, science universities, and things like that. Part okay. of that old, old Soviet system. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of uh, interesting uh, observations and questions here. One from uh, Ambassador uh, Charles Bowers, who uh, tells us that the Osh restaurant on Thompson Lane specializes in Uzbek food. He's yeah. been there and gives gives it his personal thumbs up. Yeah. So uh, so give that a try. Uh, we also have a note from uh, Karen uh, St. John, who, who mentions the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Uh, for those not familiar with the network of World Affairs Council, they do a lot of uh, travel and uh, they have a trip planned uh, next April to Uzbek, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, Silk Road trip that, that she has signed up for. So she suggests that you check out the World Affairs Council of uh, Philadelphia if you're interested in, in uh, Central Asia. Um, we're uh, we're towards the end here, uh, John. I'm I'm going to ask uh, you and and Tom. I'll ask Tom first, just to uh, share any observations on our topic for today um, on Central Asia and its importance to the United States. It's a fascinating uh, topic, and we we hope to have you come back and and talk a little bit more about uh, oh, what's what's ha what's happening in that region. Because as we look at China and Russia and the U.S. interests around the world, uh, this is really a pivotal region at, at the moment. And it, it doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Tom, anything uh, you'd like to add? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, John has done a great job in talking about the various dimensions to this, this region. It's not one that Americans really know a great deal about, but um, American influence, particularly ideological and to a certain extent popular culture, even the manner in which our history has unfolded, as John said, the interest they have in, in African-Americans and, and their role in this country. American influence can, still can play a very positive role, I think, in this region. Um, how we go about it and some of the soft power techniques are gonna require uh, some, uh, I think, considered thought. Uh, but I, I think that despite the uh, debacle of Afghanistan, we still have a role to play in mm. this area. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, again, countries are just sort of naturally curious, I think, about the United States and people have seen um, you know, uh, they're, they're exposed to the United States through popular culture, American popular culture. I had, a, I had students um, doing research papers. One young man did a paper on uh, rap music uh, and they have Tajik rap music, you know, which is interesting. Uh, another, another did a paper, I think on anime, which is not American, it's more Japanese, but still a part of the, uh, you know, kind of global, um, global genre there. So um, I can, there's a natural curiosity and especially like the young people are just naturally curious about music and, and things. And there's really a desire to learn languages. I was really, really impressed with my students um, at uh, University of Central Asia. Most of them spoke minimum four languages, minimum. They spoke Shugni, which is the local language. They spoke Tajik, they spoke Russian and they spoke English and some even a fifth language. Several of them were learning German, I think. Uh, so it's amazing. Uh, and that's, you know, again, one of the reasons why when they try to take advantage of every opportunity to travel. And uh, it's difficult because, you know, again, it's a remote part of the world, but um, it's hard to get to, it's hard to get to places. It's difficult to get to places. It's expensive, but fortunately, because the US, um, the US is doing a number of different uh, programs, education programs, and at least a few students are able to, to benefit from them. Several of my students had been to the United States on the FLEX program, which deals with high school um, students where they come to the United States for a year. And um, so they got to experience different parts of the United States. You're, you're, you're muted, Pat. You're muted, Pat. There you go. Nope, okay. Sorry, the, a fascinating part of the world and, and thank you for uh, introducing us uh, to that uh, that region. We've been talking with Professor John Miglietta from uh, Tennessee State University, 
and Professor Tom Schwartz from Vanderbilt University on Central Asia. Uh, we thank them for being with us today and, uh, and sharing their insights and perspectives. Uh, let me uh, conclude by uh, uh, again reminding you that uh, we have a great many videos on youtube.com slash TNWAC. Uh, you can check out our series on Ukraine uh, and the Russian invasion. We started back in February with Ambassador John Kornblum, and he anchored the series uh, along with some other uh, special guests. Uh, we had uh, some great insights on what's happening there. Uh, it's a continuing series, but you can find it on youtube.com slash TNWAC and along with uh, all of our other, other video presentations. And again, lastly, please consider becoming a member or supporting the Tennessee World Affairs Council. That's how we are able to bring programs like this uh, to you. So go to TNWAC.org. You can uh, either join, uh, become a member to help sustain the organization or to make a gift. Uh, that's it for us today. Uh, we appreciate you coming and, and staying with us. Uh, and again, thanks, uh, Professor Schwartz, Professor Migliera, and uh, that's it for today. Everyone have a great day.